This is chapter 43 in your Iggy book, Assessment and Care of Patients with Ear and Hearing Problems. We will begin on page 953. The priority concept for this chapter is sensory perception. Interrelated includes infection and pain. This is a review of the anatomy and physiology of the ear. You have the external canal opening, the lobule, the anti-helix, which is that inside curvature, and the helix, which is the outside. Okay, the middle and inner ear. This image is on page 955, figure 43.2. This shows you the tympanic membrane. There is also an up close and personal view of the tympanic membrane right below this figure on page 955, figure 43.3. But this shows the tympanic membrane, the semicircular canals, the ossicles, which have the stapes, the incus, and the malleus, and the eighth cranial nerve. Okay. Um, how do we test the eighth cranial nerve? If you remember, you whisper in the ear, you cover one ear and whisper um, and see how well they can hear in the other ear. The um, vestibular has to do with balance. And the cochlea is where your sound is um, made. The middle ear. This image shows the parts of the middle ear. You have the incus. The malleus is also known as the hammer. Okay, you have the short and long process malleus. You have stapes. Again, the tympanic membrane which y'all know is the eardrum, right? Um, this shows where the middle ear actually is uh, inside the head, which is interesting. And then eustachian tubes and adenoids. So this is again your picture of the tympanic membrane. It gives you all the parts of it up close. So ear and hearing changes associated with aging, some are harmless, others pose threats to hearing. We want to screen older adults for hearing acuity. And let me tell you, they don't have to be that much older. They don't even have to hardly be adults. <laughs> Lots of things can cause hearing loss or hearing difficulty. On page 957, you do have a box that says age-related changes in the ear and hearing. So you want to look at that and the nursing implications for that. Now we're going to talk about actual hearing loss. It can be conductive, sensory neural, or a combination of the two. With conductive hearing loss, there is inner ear symptoms, there is scar tissue, um, some kind of object in the outer ear or a tumor. With sensory neural, the inner ear or cranial nerve eight is damaged. It could happen because of prolonged exposure to loud noise. This is usually permanent, almost always. And if you look on page 956, table 43.1, you have comparison of the features of conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. So it tells you the different causes, um, you know, conductive is more foreign body, tumor, infection that um, causes perforation of the tympanic membrane or something like that, edema. Um, causes of sensory neural would be more like an ototoxic substance. Like for instance, sometimes antibiotics that we give can unfortunately cause hearing loss. Um, prolonged exposure to noise like we talked about, or diabetes, um, acoustic neuromas, and Meniere's disease. Assessment findings are different for each also. You can see the evidence of an obstruction with an otoscope in the conductive hearing loss. Um, with the sensory neural, there will be a normal appearance of the external canal and the tympanic membrane. Um, Tinnitus is common, so ringing in the ears, occasional dizziness. The person may speak loudly because they can't hear themselves well. Um, they hear poorly in a loud environment. C 
So um, just a little bit of a difference in the two types. The anatomy of hearing loss. When you look at the image above, you can see the different areas that are affected with conductive hearing loss. It's more the outer ear, um, the external ear, and then the, to the middle ear, to the tympanic membrane. Then with the sensory neural, it's more of the inner ear or the acoustic nerve. Then if it's a mixture of the two, um, it, it can be that there's a problem on the outer part um, and it has caused maybe like you had, somebody had um, something lodged in their ear and then it caused an infection maybe um, and that traveled down uh, into the more inner parts of the ear. So that would be an example of a combination. So what puts us at risk for hearing loss? For conductive, it could be inflammation or some obstruction, changes in the eardrum or osteosclerosis, excuse me, otosclerosis. Um, changes in the eardrum happen sometimes when people have a lot of ear infections or an eardrum ruptures. The sensory neural hearing loss damage to the inner ear or cranial nerve 8, the auditory nerve, including prolonged exposure to noise, autotoxic drugs, and presbycusis, presbycusis, excuse me. Um, this is caused by aging, and it is the degeneration of cochlear nerve cells, presbycusis. A lot of people have some percentage of hearing loss. It is estimated that about 15% of the adult population between 20 and 69 in the United States. The history, their age, their exposure to noise. Do they work in an area that has loud noises constantly that can definitely affect people's hearing? Um, how long have they had hearing changes and what type of hearing changes? Do they have any history of ear pain? Any exudate coming out of the ear or excess wax? any vertigo or tinnitus, um, and also decreased hearing. For physical assessments, let's look at page 958. There's a green box that is the focused assessment box. It says the patient with suspected hearing loss. You're going to use an otoscope and visualize the ear structures. You're going to assess functional ability. You're gonna to talk to them about how often they have to ask someone to repeat something. Do they notice or do you notice that they're talking loud, the other person is talking loud? Do they fail to respond when they are not looking in the direction of the sound? So a lot of people lip read and nobody really knows it and sometimes they don't know it. I didn't realize how much I did it until we all started wearing masks. And then I found out that I do a lot of lip reading. Um, also, people may be kind of withdrawn, and this is part of the psychosocial assessment. Because they struggle with communication, they may not go out or go to things that involve a large group anymore. They may be kind of avoiding social situations, so it can really um, have you know a lot of effect on people. If you look on, again on page 958, Communicating with a patient who is hearing impaired. This is the red box there on the left. And it talks about positioning yourself directly in front of the patient, uh, making sure that you don't have a bright light behind you. Make sure that the room is well lit. Speak slow and clear. You may need to move closer to the better hearing ear. Um, get their attention before you speak. Don't shout. Um, don't put anything over your mouth and uh, rephrase sentences and repeat information to aid understanding. So you may have to, sh you know, make things short and sweet. Have the patient repeat your statement so you know that they understand, okay? For your laboratory assessment, the thing that we could look at would be the white blood cell count, which could indicate an ear infection if it's up. Imaging assessments, we use x-rays of the skull to see any bone invo involvement that may be causing trouble. 
We can also use a CT or MRI scan. That will show tish, soft tissues and tumors. Other things that we can do is audiometry, which is a hearing test, just the spoken word. There's also frequency, intensity, and threshold testing. And on page 960, table 43.2 talks about diagnostic studies and associated uh, nursing care. And then table 43.3 is decibel intensity and safe exposure time for common sounds. When we're analyzing cues and talking about our hypotheses, um, we would use decreased hearing ability due to obstruction, infection, damage to the middle ear, or damage to the auditory nerve. Decreased functional ability, meaning communication, due to difficulty in hearing. Planning and implementation. How are we going to increase hearing and maximize communication? Non-surgically, we can give antibiotics and analgesics if there is an infection. Also, patients that have hearing aids, that is a non-surgical management of hearing loss. For those who really need surgical intervention, we can do a cochlear implant. And as far as maximizing communication, there is such a thing as a tympanoplasty that reconstructs the middle ear. If you look at page 962, okay, um, there's a picture of a cochlear implant, figure 43.6, that I just mentioned. And then if you look at figure 43.8, you see surgical approaches for repair of the ear and hearing structures. So, for instance, at the top, there's a hole in the eardrum, and they can actually just patch that eardrum, just like you're patching some jeans or something. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um Recovery from ear surgery is on page 963, so go over that box. You want them to avoid straining, avoid drinking through a straw for two to three weeks. You don't want them to travel in an airplane because of the changes in pressure in their ears and their head. You want them to avoid coughing excessively, try to stay away from people who are sick. They have to blow their nose really gently and not block their nostrils when they're doing it and keep their mouth open. That keeps all the pressure um, so that it's not all built up and hitting them at once. Avoid getting their head wet or washing their hair for several days. They can shower, but they need to put a cotton ball soaked with Vaseline in their ear, okay? Or a waterproof earplug. They don't want... Um, or they shouldn't get like on a trampoline or do something where their head's going to be moving rapidly or bouncing. If you have a dressing change, it can be every 24 hours or as directed and report excessive drainage immediately to your primary health care provider. Home care management, transition to home care, um, prevention of infection and trauma on page 963. That's the box at the bottom there. So here's what we need to teach our patients. Don't use any small objects and stick them in your ear. It doesn't help to clean your external ear canal with a toothpick or your uh, fingernail or something like that, hairpin. Wash the external ear and canal daily in the shower or while washing your hair. Now this is not immediately after surgery, remember. Blow the nose gently, don't block the nostril, sneeze with your mouth open, wear protection around loud or continuous noise, avoid or wear head and ear protection during activities with high risk for head or ear trauma, such as wrestling, boxing, motorcycle riding, and skateboarding. Keep the volume on head receivers at the lowest setting that allows you to hear. I don't know why that's so hard for all of us to do. People want to crank those earbuds up um, so you can hear them when you're standing next to them, but um, please avoid doing that. Save your hearing, trust me. Frequently clean objects that come into contact with your ear, like your headphones, um, things like that. Your phone itself, this is telephone receiver, well, your phone. <laughs> 
Um, avoid environmental conditions with rapid changes in air pressure. So again, riding in airplanes, um, maybe high elevations, things like that. Now we've talked about how a lot of times hearing loss is permanent. So when we're evaluating our outcomes, we want to talk about having at least a partial improvement of hearing or the appropriate use of a hearing of hearing compensation behaviors. So um, either reading lips or using a hearing aid, okay? We want the client to not have a lot of anxiety about what's going on. We want them to feel comfortable with their communication and we want them to be able to communicate effectively most of the time. They can use sign language, uh, lip reading, closed captioning, or video description for television viewing. We want them to accurately interpret messages and use nonverbal language. So remember, for instance, if you're talking to them, you want them to tell you back what you just said. So you make sure that they understand. Otitis media, the good old ear infection. Ear pain, hearing may be decreased, tinnitus, headache, malaise, nausea, and dizziness. We use analgesics, antihistamines, decongestants, and possibly myringotomy, which is tubes in the ears. Some of you probably had tubes in your ears or you have kids who have had <laughs> tubes in their ears. Um, I think everybody's pretty familiar with that. Otitis media starts on page 965. And um, the figures there, figure 4310, will uh, show you the site of infection and then figure 4311 shows you a perforated tympanic membrane. Otitis media may be acute or chronic and the eardrum can be perforated so that is that second figure there where the tympanic membrane is perforated. You want to tell the client no strenuous activity, no forceful coughing, don't drink through a straw, Avoid sick people, good hand washing, keep your ears dry, and blow your nose gently with the mouth open. All the things that we've already talked about. They're going to need ear drops, antibiotics, and also systemic antibiotics. All right, look on page 966, and you will see a picture of external otitis, and boy does it look Miserable. That just looks like it hurts so badly. Painful, red, swollen external ear, often caused by irritating or infectious agents, may have temporary hearing loss. We need to remove materials from the ear canal, put heat to the ear three times a day, and they will have topical antibiotics as well as ear drops. Mastoiditis. This is on page 967. Infection of the mastoid cells caused by progressive otitis media. So an ear infection that um, is either real resistant to antibiotics or is left untreated um, goes into mastoiditis. It will cause swelling behind the ear, pain when moving the ear or head, red, dull, thick, immobile eardrum. So when you look in there with the otoscope, um, the eardrum will be noticeably red and thick. We treat with antibiotics. They may have to do surgical removal of the infected tissue if the antibiotics do not work. Trauma can occur to the eardrum, the ossicles, and the middle ear structures. If you have a perforated eardrum, a perforated tympanic membrane, it often will heal in a week or two without any treatment. However, if you keep having perforations to the eardrum, um, they will scar over, which can cause problems with hearing. Your hearing may or may not return if the ossicles are damaged. So um, it can be a permanent hearing loss from trauma. Tinnitus is a ringing in the ears. It can be a continuous ringing or it can be a ringing that comes and goes. Sometimes it is a high frequency sound. Sometimes it's like a roaring sound. Um, there's no test to confirm it, but they can do a hearing test to rule out other disorders.
and sometimes just hearing loss itself causes tinnitus. Therapy focuses on ways to mask the tinnitus or tinnitus. Meniere's disease. This includes tinnitus, one-sided auditory loss, headache, fullness in the ear, and vertigo. The vertigo is usually episodic, so it's not somebody that's dizzy all the time, but they'll have episodes of dizziness, and it may be mild dizziness, or it may be really bad, which, of course, if it's really bad, then they get nauseous and um, might even vomit. So it just can escalate you know, to a lot of problems. This usually is diagnosed between 20 and 60 years of age. The hearing loss can be permanent over time. You want to teach them to move slowly. They may need vestibular rehabilitation therapy, drug therapy, or a labyrinthectomy. You want to put them on a low sodium diet. You want them to stop smoking and make sure they are compliant with their medications. An acoustic neuroma is a benign tumor of cranial nerve eight. This is a tumor shown on an MRI image here. Um, the large acoustic neuroma widens the left internal auditory canal and compresses that canal. Again, it's a benign tumor of cranial nerve eight. Signs are tinnitus, progressive to gradual hearing loss, mild to moderate vertigo. Nearby cranial nerves can be damaged by the enlarging tumor. It is tr or shown, it is diagnosed on an MRI or high resolution CT scan, and they may have to remove it surgically. Here's a case study. The daughter of an eight-year-old client reports that her father's hearing has significantly diminished over the past few years. The client tells the nurse, that's not true. My hearing is just fine. What is the appropriate nursing response? I'm sure you're just fine. Why don't you believe your daughter? Everyone worries about losing their hearing or it must feel frightening to think about losing your hearing. So the correct answer would be D and you would want to get them talking about um, why they're in complete denial of their hearing loss. And you will find as you work with patients that this is a very typical response. All right, so I'm gonna let you go over the rest of the case study and the questions on your own. Thank you for your time.